somebody one of those? So they left for champagne this morning. Also, remember uh, Henry Manon who fell and broke his, his rib. And praise God, Jean's here this morning for his health. Joy showing for her health, Sue Schwartz for her back, Jack Heinrich, her son, and uh, Jim Dennis for his health, and Andy Dees, Isla Etheridge. There's just so many needs. If I went through this entire prayer uh, request list, we'd be here all service. Um, there's just so many needs for people for health, for salvation, for healing, for all kinds of requests that God has commanded us to bring before him, as Paul wrote in the New Testament. So let's go ahead and bring this request to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day, for the people that have gathered here to worship you, dear Lord, in your house. We pray, Lord, for your salvation, for those that need it, dear Lord, that are among us and that are out in this world, dear Lord, this lost world that needs you so desperately, dear Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, for Rick Champ, dear Lord, as his kidneys shut down, Lord, if it be your will, please heal him. We are still believing that you can, dear Lord, and that you will. Please heal him, dear Lord, of everything that is ailing his body. Please bless his kids. Bless Mindy and Dennis, dear Lord, as they're driving up there. Please give them said travels, dear Father. Thank you, Lord, for his life, for all that he has done to serve you and to worship you, and dear Lord, for these prayer requests that we mentioned, dear Lord, for your healing touch to be in each and every situation, dear Father, each and every person who has an ailment, dear Lord, please heal them, please grant salvation to all those that are that are looking for it, dear Lord, that don't even know that they're looking for it. Please bless them and protect them, dear Lord Jesus. We pray for our country and for our state, dear Lord Jesus, that you will bless the leaders of it, dear Lord, that that we will be guided in accordance with your will and in accordance with your wishes, dear Father. Again, as the service progresses, dear Lord, please be with Randy, dear Lord, as he delivers your message. Please help him to find the right words to say. Please uh, help us to have receptive hearts, dear Lord, that we will put into practice your message that we hear this day, Lord, into our lives, that we may draw ever closer to you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
it on. <coughs> Can we? Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Grace is an undeserved favor or gift. Kindness and mercy that God gives us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 continues. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. So. In our Sunday school lesson today, we were talking about grateful faith, and uh, God has been so good to us, how can we say thanks to him? Let us pray. Father, how can I say thanks for all the things you've done for me? It is with a grateful heart, Lord, that we all open our heart to you, and we seek to do those good works you made us to do. And Father, I pray a blessing on this church. I pray, pray a blessing on each person sitting here that <coughs> their good works will multiply and be felt throughout this community. Oh, Lord God, be with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
good morning, everyone. Uh, Dill gave me this, but you know, I talk loud, so I know you all hear me. But no, at this time, it's a time when we give back to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He gives so much to us each and every day, it's amazing. And without Him in our lives, you know, where would we be? We'd be lost, you know, and we'd still be out searching for Him, our Lord and Savior. And uh, at this time of offering, I just want to read a short verse from Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. Whoever is kind to the Lord, or whoever is kind to the poor, lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every day. It is truly a blessing. We offer ourselves to you each and every day to give back for what you have done to us all of our lives. We ask for your hand to touch these blessings and offerings so that they uh, may go forth and uh, to help spread your word and your love and grace throughout the world. In your name we give all praise, honor, and glory, dear Lord. Amen.
get ready to study. Uh, first off, Ron, could you turn on the overhead lights in here? I want to make sure everyone is right and alert as we study the Word of God and as we preach uh, and join in worship together. So if you bow your heads, let's pray together as we prepare for that. Father, we give you the praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for you, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that we have through you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your leading, guiding accounts. We ask for that here and now as we uh, look at the truth of your word, Lord, and as we study it, I pray for uh, just alert minds and hearts that we would be uh, convicted of the things we need to be and, and just understand the importance of your Bible, the truth, and uh, how we should know, learn, and study it. Uh, again, Lord, we give you the praise, glory, and honors. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, I know a lot of you realize that as a church or pastor, preacher, you get attached to people, do you not? I mean, we got love and care for each other here in this room. Um, I was thinking the other day, and, and I was talking to some people about the Cox family. You guys remember Dr. Cox and her family? Uh, I think about them, and I think about how good of a doctor she was. And the reason I think about that is because, you know, she used to be our church's kind of resident doctor. If you had a question, you'd go up and ask her on a Sunday morning, and she would kind of give you some uh, advice. But what I loved about her, she was the, my, my parents' doctor when uh, they were here in town. And she would take the time as a doctor to sit and listen to what kind of medications they took, what was going on, what was going on in, in their life, uh, how all those pieces fit together. And what was so good was, instead of just trying to add more medication or whatever, she would try to figure out the balance. And she would say, you need to do more of this. And I mean, even things like the vitamins, visuals, all that sort of stuff. You know, what is the right balance? The reason I give you that picture this morning is because I want you to understand this. When we look at Scripture, we look at God, we look at a relationship with Him, we need to have balance. And what I mean by that is, and we're going to be using this illustration probably over the span of this sermon series of three, three trees. And uh, the reason is this. Uh, the illustration is this. If you're driving the bus and you've got a driver... You know, maybe it's your van or your car. And you guys can think about this when you sit in your vehicle on the way home. But you got the driver, you got your passenger seat, you got the seats behind you, and all these things. And, and say we take these different things, uh, one being truth, one being experience, one being feelings, one being other people or our family. And we look at this vehicle we're driving. The question is, and the thing that we're going to keep on asking as we go through this series is, Who's driving the vehicle? And what I mean by that is so often, and, and I'll give you a, a quick picture of this. As a preacher or a pastor, you know, I get to talk to people all the time. And it used to be, back in the old days, the good days, that someone would come into your office and you would, they would ask you a question and, and you go, well, let's look at what it says here in the Bible. And so you would point it out in the Bible and you would show that to the person as you sat there in the office or you sat studying over a cup of coffee or whatever the case was. And the person across from you would say, very good. I'm going to try to do that. I want my life to align to that. I want the Bible to be the truth that I live by and that's how I'm going to determine things. Fast forward a bit. And nowadays, you know, I'll, I'll hear statements like, doesn't it say in the Bible? And you know what my response is a lot of times to that? Absolutely not. It doesn't say that at all. <laughs> or that's totally out of context. And you know why I found so many times that I would go through and point out the things in the Bible, and people won't necessarily say this, but when they get up to leave, they're like, uh, oh, well, I don't care. Uh, you know, or they go out and do exactly opposite of what you just pointed out in the truth of the scripture. Reason why? A lot of people, instead of the truth of God's word being the driver of our lives, we let our experiences, our relationships, and all that be the driver. Now, we want some Bible, we want some truth, we want some God, we want some in Jesus. And that's why we see all across the board today in churches all throughout the U.S., where services and your time together is all about the experience you're going to have when you're in this room. Let me tell you, that is not necessarily a real good basis. I, I, I want you all to have a good experience. I think the praise team up here is one of the best. I love the music. 
Those are good things, and we should rejoice and praise God and, and all of that. But we should also worship Him with our intellect and our mind. And you cannot have a strong, good, solid foundation, relationship, salvation, just on heart. Jesus Christ said, do you remember what He said about the, the number one thing we should do? To love the Lord your God with what? Your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. He took that directly out of the scriptures that were at hand to him at that time and also added strength to it. Why? Because he understands just like a doctor. When, I, when I'm up here preaching, it's like a doctor for your soul, your heart, your mind, your spirit. What do you <coughs> need? And I strongly, I, I don't know how to... With everything I am, I think one of the biggest problems that we have, you and I personally, and I'm not talking just outside the walls, I'm talking about here in this house, is we need to be biblically literate to understand the connection of God's word, his truth. It's such a fascinating thing. You guys remember last week I shared a few details and uh, we talked about Caesar. You remember Caesar from Rome and all that? How many manuscript or scrolls uh, do we have that tells us the historical proof of Caesar? You remember? Yeah, it was like 11. There was a couple others that I threw in there. You remember what the historical scroll, just the scrolls of the New Testament, how much proof we have of that? 5,686 different scrolls. Just in the pure aspect of a written word, a piece of literature... The Bible is so fascinating. There is nothing like it in all of creation. And I've got a theory of why on that. I believe it's the actual truth of God's word to his people. Now, as we talk about the three trees, the idea of this series is that we're answering questions, we're dealing with things of apologetics. Apologetics just simply meaning that we're taking the truth of God's word, and it's a defense of the gospel, a defense of God's word, that we are able to stand as Christian men and women and answer our neighbor, our family, our friends as to why we believe. Number one thing for, for Christians, you know, it's our responsibility to share the gospel, and we're told to be prepared to give a witness or a testimony, and yet so many of us, when we're asked to give a witness or a testimony, what do we say? Well, this has been my experience. Not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not trying to downplay that. But along with your experience, you need to be able to tell the truth of God's word intellectually. There needs to be a connection between our mind, our heart, our soul, and our strength. So, with that said, to follow me today, you need to be connected because I'm jumping all over the place. Three trees. Talking about the knowledge of the tree of the, uh, the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How Adam and Eve were told not to eat of it. When they did eat of it, they were open to these things and to evil and stuff of that nature. The tree that Jesus was hung on is a tree that re-establishes our connection, our ability to have with the tree of life. So we go from Genesis to Revelation, and here's some of what's in between. First question for you to think about today. Where do you place your faith? I've been watching, I told the, the study group this last week, I'm probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 hours of watching debates and stuff over this last couple of weeks. Uh, debates between atheists and Christians and things of that nature. And the question always comes back to one of these, where do you put your faith? Well, an atheist would say they don't put their faith in anything. That's not a true statement. Absolutely not true. Every single person puts their faith into something. It's not really an option. You, as a human, will put your faith into something. We'll look at the definition of that in just a second. And then this second question is the big one for you and I here this morning. Is the Bible real, true, and accurate? Can we put ourselves into it? Can we make our choices based just simply off of what the Bible says? Is it our guide, as you know, a lot of people say, is it basic? In, uh, what is it? Uh, basic instruction before leaving her? Yeah. So, is it really that? And as we look at the definition, according to Merriam-Webster, of what faith is, faith, 
as it defines as a devotion to duty or person, loyalty being the key word there, the quality of keeping one's promises, a belief and trust in and loyalty to God, belief in the doctrines of a religion, firm belief even in the absence of proof, and complete confidence. So, as you look at that definition, you kind of let that sink in for just a second. Every single one of you, and every single person outside the church today, have their faith in something. Now, one of the things that has gotten me over the years as I listen to debates and I hear people talk about being an atheist or something of that nature, um, I have a hard time believing that anyone is a true atheist. Yeah. And what I mean by that, and there will be a term that you will probably hear quite a bit of, I can see how a person could be an agnostic. An agnostic is just a simple term meaning that it is a person that believes in God or believes in a God, but that that God, like a clock, wound it up, set it in place, and then left. So, you know, they believe in a God that created this earth but has no relationship with us, doesn't have a personal relationship, any of that kind of thing. I can see where a person might believe that. But to be an atheist of one that doesn't believe in absolutely nothing is to put your faith in nothing. We're going to look at some of that as we go down through some of these questions today. There's four tests that we're going to keep hitting over these next couple of months. The first one is the etern internal consistency. When we talk about internal consistency, that means when you read the Bible, do you read somewhere in the Bible where it says one thing's a sin and then it changes and says it's not a sin and then it says somewhere else in another book <coughs> it is a sin and then it jumps into something else? Is it consistent? Is it the same truth? You know, the Bible was written over a period of almost 1,500 years by over 40 people, and yet the consistency of what it says from Genesis to Revelation is spot on. Well, how can that be? I got a theory on that. I believe it was written by one, God. And that God inspired and spoke his word through his people, and they put their experiences and their stuff through God's control. Second one, historical consistency. Meaning basically, is it historically accurate? Do we read the things in that word? Are they historically true to the other proofs and things that we have along the lines? Do other historians prove? Take the life of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that Jesus Christ lived on this earth if you don't have the Bible? Absolutely. It's recorded in history by other people groups. It's recorded in history by people that were not Christians about this Jesus. Third one, prophetic accuracy. When we talk about prophetic accuracy, we're talking about things that were said to, that were going to come years in advance. Uh, we literally have in Scripture where it talks about the exile of God's people being taken over by Babylon and carried off into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. We literally have in the scriptures hundreds of years previous the name of the king of Persia that would stop that and change all that. Those are the kinds of things we look for. Is it prophetically accurate? And then the last is scientific accuracy. If the word of God is true and accurate, then it should stand against the test of science. This is a big one. And when you listen to debates, this is the one that always is being debated about, are the things in the Bible true and accurate scientifically? We're going to look at some of those here this day, but before we do, I want to read to you 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 through 17. This is some writing from the Apostle Paul to his disciple Timothy, who is also a teacher and a leader and director in his, this region. As it says here in these verses, this is Paul speaking, you, however, Know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance. What's Paul saying to Timothy? You know me. You know whether or not I'm the real deal. You know that when I preach, that I practice what I preach. You've seen me. You've walked with me. You know who I am. So he goes on to say, persecutions, suffering, what kind of things happen to me in Antioch? Iconum and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. So we know that of the Apostle Paul. 
that he was beaten, that he was tortured, uh, that he was literally left for dead, that he was whipped and lashed for his faith. Uh, we know that he was shipwrecked. We know that he was falsely accused. All these kind of things were happening in his life. Why? Because he was preaching about Jesus Christ. All he had to do was stop, and he could have lived a comfortable life. Matter of fact, when he became Paul instead of Saul, he was living at the top of life as far as a person here on earth. <clears throat> but because of his faith in Jesus Christ, this persecution came on him. He says, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. <coughs> There's one recording that talks about Paul being beaten and stoned so bad that they left him for dead and thought he would die. And you remember what happened? He got up and went back into town, got back on his feet, and uh, the Lord rescued him once again to continue to preach the gospel. It goes on to say, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. What's that statement? If you're a Christian man or woman, and you're standing up for the truth of who Jesus Christ is, and you're intellectually standing up according to the promises of God's word, his Bible, and standing for that truth, you will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I always love this next part. You know which part I love? You guys have been around for a while. You know what I'm getting ready to say. It's the word but. Anytime you see the word but in the Bible, something very important is coming. This is but as for you. Who's the you there? Timothy. As for you, continue what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it. Is that true of you? How many of you have grown up with some kind of church background? How many of you know the men, the women, your parents, your grandparents, whoever it was that passed on that biblical truth to you, how many of you know that they were genuine and true? All right? So what you have learned from that, continue in that because you know the one from whom you learned it goes on to say in that, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus. How long did Timothy know this? From infancy. How many of you, any of you grew up in church? You know, I always say I grew up from the time I was in diapers. I can't ever remember missing a Sunday in church. Only one time do I recall in all my years of being in school that I missed a Sunday in church. Anybody remember when that was? The new Transformers cartoon was coming out, so I was sick that Sunday morning. You know, I'm, I'm feeling kind of sick, Mom. And so I had to stay home to watch the Transformers cartoon. Not a good idea. That was pre-Christian day before I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Um, but from his infancy, Timothy had learned this truth. Anybody know, just a little biblical trivia, where the, where, who does it say that Timothy had learned this from infancy? Do you remember? A couple of people are mentioned. Two in particular. Lois. All right. You're going, whoa. Bible man. He goes straight to the names. I was just even thinking about just a relationship. But Lois and yes. Eunice. Eunice. Good. Okay. And who was Lois and Eunice? Mother and grandma. Just want to continue to impress upon you, especially a lot of you, and I won't look at anybody in particular, but as I look at on this place and I see grandparents and gray hair, things of that nature, how important it is for mothers and grandmas, men too, the Bible talks a lot about the men, the fathers, the grandfathers, but specifically here for Timothy, without that, that his mom and his grandma impressed on him the truth of the Holy Scriptures. What Holy Scriptures are we talking about well, the Old Testament, of course. And the Old Testament had been established. The canon had already been established at this point. How many books were there in that Old Testament canon? I'm going to keep hitting you with all this kind of stuff. That's why you got to be alert. 39 different books of the Old Testament canon that Timothy had learned from infancy. And this is what it said. That are able... Listen to this real carefully. Are you listening? Paying attention? Are able... To make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You catch how important that is for you to understand here this morning? That it's able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
What, 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 what picture is in your head when you hear that or read that? Are you thinking that it's some emotional reaction when you read something like that? That salvation, that one going forward to give their life to Jesus Christ is some emotional reaction when you read a passage like that? What do you read? <coughs> What's it talking about? It's talking about the Bible. It's talking about the scriptures. And it's talking about you and I intellectually, mentally understanding and learning the truth. I'm here to tell you, feelings can be very deceiving. Any of you all know that? That's why it's so important to let right truth be the guide to our feelings instead of the other way around. The last part of it says, all scripture is God-breathed. What's that mean? That over this span of time, this many years, these men that, and the women that God spoke through, that it was through them that he used their experiences, he used their point of reference, their life, and put what he wanted into his word and truth. We're going to look at some of those truths in just a second. It was useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's see. Since it said man, I'll just pick on the guys for just a second. How many of you men, all you guys in here, look up at me for a second. How many of you men are thoroughly equipped in the Bible right now to do the training, to do that leading, to do the rebuking, to do the correcting, the training, all that? I, I'm not trying to make anybody upset. I'm just trying to tell you what it says in the Bible. If and I said this last week. If the Bible is God's word to you for correction, guidance, and all that, you and I as well would be absolutely crazy not to know that Bible. And if it's not true, if Jesus isn't true, you'd be absolutely crazy to read it as well. So either way, you're crazy, right? <laughs> Here's the deal. And I'm going to point out a few of these. As we went through this list, I already talked about this. We're going to look at the scientific accuracy. I know our Wednesday morning Bible study and our Wednesday night Bible study group kind of looked at this. Some of the truths that are in the evidence Bible, which just goes through and highlights some of the scientific things that are there in the scriptures. I want to highlight a few of those to you real quickly. We're going to look at ten of them. And I'm going to go through this pretty quick. You guys ready? You need to stand up and shake or stretch or anything? Here we go. Number one. The Earth's free float in space. Now, when you hear a term like that, what do you think I'm talking about? That we're in an orbit. It says in the scriptures, Job 26, 7, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the Earth over nothing. Anybody know where Job falls in the time order of being written for the Bible? First. It is the first and oldest book of the Old Testament. Do you know, scientifically, it was almost 3,000 years later that humankind found out that the earth is in an orbit and literally hangs on nothing? Where do we see that? How would a writer that had no comprehension of that, remember what they used to think? Anybody know? It's flat. It's flat. What was it? Flat. Well, we're going to look at that in just a second, too. That they used to believe the earth was completely flat, that it was just a you know flat surface, which makes sense. I mean, when I'm sitting here, I don't think that we're spinning around this right now with over 100, what is it? It's like a few hundred miles an hour we're spinning right now. Do you guys feel it? Yeah, yeah the earth's rotation is going around so quickly right now. You think that in a 24-hour period, this earth will make a complete spin. How fast does it have to spin? And yet not one of us in this room feel it. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And yet, before any of this was ever understood in God's word, it said that the earth hung on nothing. What they used to think was that it was like on the back of a tortoise. Like you had this flat disc on the back of a tortoise. That's the way it was. If you look at any of those old pictures, you would see that. All right, the second one. To wash your hands under running water. 
This has only been a few hundred years old. As a matter of fact, I was uh, in the video they had talked about how the birth rate, how many women were dying, giving birth, and their birth death rate used to be like 30%. But what was so wild about it was that these doctors would go and examine one lady, wipe their hands off with a towel, and then go examine another lady. And so when they realized this truth about washing their hands, and the doctor that brought that realized about washing their hands, once they started washing their hands, they said overnight the death rate went from 30% to 2%. Phenomenal, right? Look what it says in Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13. When a man is cleansed from his discharge, he is to count off seven days for a ceremonial cleansing. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with fresh which is also translated Hebrew wise, running water, and he will be clean. You realize these things are written thousands of years previous to anybody having that understanding. They didn't understand those microorganisms that were, you know, would uh, contaminate your hands or be on you. And yet the scriptures, thousands of years previous, told people that this was the way that you should take care of yourself. Why would we have that instruction? Well, I thoroughly believe that God understood his people and he knew what we needed and so he gave instruction and if you lived according to that instruction, what did it say in the Bible? That you would be blessed and live long and these things would be good. There are always physical attributes or, or, or uh, principles to be lived by from the truth of God's word. They weren't just given to us for no, no reason. Third one, that the information is in your blood. Talking about your DNA. Right now, if any of you guys, any of you have medical problems, any of you been to see a doctor this year? Nobody? Yeah. yeah, you know, all of, probably most of you in this room, uh, not me, but I haven't been in quite a while. I, I need to go, my wife keeps telling me that. <laughs> However, it says, the information is in the blood. <coughs> well, you know what my wife talking about right now is that I haven't had a blood drawn in oh, 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 probably about two years or so, and she says, I really need to get my blood drawn. Why would I need to get my blood drawn? Check your what? All right, yeah. So if you check the blood, you can tell things like PSAs. You can tell uh, sugar, whether you're diabetic or on that verge of that. You can tell cholesterol, triglycerides. You guys know the story. A doctor can draw your blood and tell all kinds of things about you. What's it say here? It says verse 11 of Leviticus 17. For the life of a creature is where? In the blood, and I give it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Throughout the scriptures, it talks about the sacredness of blood. It talks about not eating creatures with their blood in it, pouring that blood out. It says that you're going to have to give an account for every bit of blood that is spilled. That if a man is killed and his blood is poured into the ground, an account's going to be given because God knows. The sacredness of blood. Thousands of years previous, God told us that the, life, the blood is the life of the flesh. All right, number four. Who was just saying that the earth was flat? Anybody still believe that? No. No? Just Reagan? You know, this is, it's all joking aside that uh, not too far back ago, there were still people that believed that the earth was flat. Uh, but we know without doubt today that the earth is not flat. And yet thousands of years before that understanding, Isaiah wrote, verse 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And if people are like grasshoppers, he stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live, to live in. Matter of fact, if you look at that word in Hebrew, that word is probably better translated the word for circle as sphere. What's a sphere? It's, it's a circular ball. How in the world, thousands of years before we knew this, were they able to write that? Hmm, makes you think, right? These are the kind of things intellectually we should know and think about. Number five, the Bible and oceanography. I absolutely love this one. 
the father of oceanography, the guy that's considered the one who has discovered these things, the one that we still read about in colleges and stuff, they still use his uh, Maurice. I think it's Maurice is his name. Anyways, he said when he found like the Gulf Streams and the paths in the sea, the reason that he went looking for that was because he was a Christian. And he read it in the Bible, and therefore he knew that there had to be paths in the sea. Psalm 8, 8. The birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. That's why we know about these currents in the ocean is because a Christian man knew that there had to be paths in the sea. You guys also know there are paths in the air as well. That when you fly airplanes and stuff, they look for those jet streams and paths. Yes. All right, number six, light waves and radio waves. And this one I didn't quite understand quite as well, but the more I think about it, it does make a whole lot of sense. In Job 38, which again was the oldest book of the Bible in writing order, uh, verse 35 says, Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? And, uh, you know, we have that sense in that scripture that these lightning, uh, light waves, uh, lightning can speak. It might be a bit of a stretch, but as you think about it, how many of you this day have a cell phone? Anybody care? Nobody brought their phones to church, right? Because you don't want to be distracted. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have these smartphones, you, and you and I both know right now, and many of you were in this room when I was over in Africa. We'd throw it up on the screen, and you would see us having service. Well, you didn't see it because the electricity was out of there, and it was completely dark. But this, at this very moment, matter of fact, this afternoon, I'll probably... There's a little game I like to play on my phone now. I always tell my kids, don't put any games on my phone because once they're on there, I can't. Oh, well, i got to beat it. But I pull that up, and I play that game, and what I like, like about it is someone else is playing against me in China, in Japan, in Brazil, in India. I mean, it pulls up their little flag and shows where they're from, and I'm like, I'm going to beat that Chinese guy. <laughs> Instantaneously. I'm playing against, or probably reality is, it's probably some little eight-year-old girl beating my can at this little video game. You know what I'm saying, though? Instantaneous communication. <coughs> Light waves, radio waves. Right now, we took a radio, hooked it up here in this sanctuary. We could tune in to all these different waves that are in this room that none of us even know are. Well, we know mentally that they're here, but we cannot see radio waves, sound waves, things of that nature. Number seven, the first law of thermodynamics. Who knows how to give a, a, just a real general definition of the first law of thermodynamics? What's it basically say? Well, it is about heat, yeah, thermo, dynamics, that energy. But basically the principle or the real simple definition is this, that uh, something cannot come from nothing. <clears throat> That you have to have something in order to get something. You know, a lot of the world says that something came from nothing, which does not make scientific <coughs> truth. Thing for us, as a Christian, we don't have a problem with that because we believe that there was something, and that something was God, and that God spoke into creation. And think about this one again universe, what does that word mean, universe? Think about it. Una means one, and verse means phrase. Literally, the word universe means one spoken phrase. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from the God that we read of in the Bible, the God that is the creator of all things. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 said, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Now, the understanding, the thing that, that's important for us to understand in that is that when God completed all his work, it says that it took place in six days. What happened on the seventh day? He rested and he looked and he said, this is good. And he admired his work. You and I, I think you and I probably understand and know this, that God didn't need to physically rest. It was just his way of saying he rested on the beauty and the glory of what had been created. And it was also a, a teaching to us that out of those seven days, we are to rest 
one day a week. Why is that so important? Do you know it really says in the scriptures in, to the nation of Israel that if you do not keep sacred or, or, or keep the Sabbath, that you will be bringing, bringing terrible things down on yourselves simply for not doing that. God's word teaches that those physical principles I've been talking about, how important it is for you mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually to spend one day of rest in Him, admiring and adoring God. Now, the other aspect of this verse goes into the whole idea that the earth was completed. This isn't an unformed system. From the beginning, God created and it was finished. It's a self-sustaining system. It's not something that's continually to evolve. And what, when we hear the word evolve, what does the word evolve mean? Change. But what kind of change? For better or for worse? <coughs> for better. The word evolve means to become better and better. So how do we take into those considerations, those things that aren't? We know scientifically that the earth is what? That it is, in our own understanding of things, the earth is ticking down. It's getting worse. That over time is slowing down. That all these things are happening to the earth. We understand as Christians that God completed it, that it was finished, that he was the one that created it. Number eight. I'll dig this one too. Chip dimensions. Genesis chapter 6 verse 15 says, This is how you are to build it. So, talking to Noah, and here was a description for the ark. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Massive. Incredible. Beautiful. Uh, architecturally wonderful. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go out here in our back field, if you stand down there like by the hill there on the ditch to the woods, that's about the length of the ark. It was huge. Here's the interesting facts for you. Ships nowadays. Anybody been on a cruise in this room? Boat. The ratio that is used for the ark, guess what? Is still the best floating ship-wise ratio that they have found for your cruise ships, for boats, the same ratio of length to width to height. They say that uh, scientific studies have been done and they still show that the ark was the most incredible floating ship ever uh, invented. Absolutely phenomenal. Number nine, the Bible and quarantine. What's a quarantine? Separate. Be, yeah, be separated, uh, to be put by themselves, whatever the case is, or a group of people with the same kind of infections and put in the same group. <clears throat> says in Leviticus chapter 13, 46, as long as he has the affection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. All right, I'm going to pair these two real quick to the running water and to the quarantine. Uh, many of you ever heard of the Black Plague or the, the Black Death? Yeah. Yeah, I, I forget what years that took place. Maybe some of you that are a little more history buff would know. But it is said that if they had followed the teachings of God's word and what it said about using running water and quarantine, that the Black Death could have almost been wiped out completely. Isn't that phenomenal to think of? And I know some of you in this room are going to say, well, they weren't living in cities like where that took place. Do any of you know in the wilderness when, when the Israelites were roaming around, for the 40 years and then they went into the promised land. How many people were in the midst of this little group of people? Just a few little people, huh? A couple million. Yeah. Over a million people. How many of you have been camping lately? Any of you go camping with a million people? <laughs> How do you get the resources and the sanitary and all that sort of thing for a million people to go camping out in the woods? Do you think God had direction or guidance for his people? How do you think they did it? Following the truth of what God's Word taught, they lived in lives that were different than everyone around them, and yet they were healthier, stronger, better. They survived things that shouldn't have been survivable. Why? Well, I believe it had to do with the Bible and God's truth and His Word that He gives to His people. The last one here, the Bible and 
dinosaurs. How many of y'all believe in dinosaurs? I believe in dinosaurs. Yeah. How many of y'all believe in dinosaurs as described so often in children's books, things of that nature? I might have a little differences with that. Let's look at what it says in the scriptures. In Job chapter 40, again, which book is Job? The oldest of all the written books of the Bible. Job 40, I'm not going to read that entire section. I'm going to just read a few verses. Verse 15, look at the behemoth. Anybody know which dinosaur we think is being described as a behemoth? T-Rex. Before we read, not T-Rex. Bronchiosaurus. How do you say bronchi? Bronchi bronchiosaurus. Bronchial. He had pro bronchial problems. Bronchiosaurus. <laughs> All right. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you. Who is it you here? People, you. Uh, so what's that say? Well, billions of years ago, the dinosaurs were made, and then the caveman came along. And is that what it says? No, it says I created him with you at the same time. And which feeds on grass like an ox, which strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. What's a cedar? A tree, okay. Uh, the sinews of his thighs are like close knit. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like rod of iron. He ranks first. Where's he rank? First among the works of God. What do you think that means? He ranks first among the works of God. Okay, yeah. And, you know, and literally we read this next portion, yet his neighbors can approach him with his sword. Uh, Mike summed it up pretty simple. Don't mess with him. Uh, man, literally, to kill a bronchiosaurus was, you know, all unheard of. And these are so massive, so strong. Some of the pictures that we see are probably not too far off of what those dinosaurs were like. And who did it say? Who's the only one that can hold a sword to him? The maker. Frank's first. Think of a creature like that. How awesome, powerful, wonderful. Uh, the scriptures talk about the behemoth. It also talks about one other specific way you remember? The bivon, uh, which was most likely a creature of the water. Uh, one of these huge creatures. Um, one other piece of fact, and this is just a little ed 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 extra add-in for you this morning. Uh, how long does a reptile grow? Well, let me ask you this question. How, how long does a human grow? How many years? 17 or 18. Yeah, you know, it actually can range anywhere, on, even up to, there's knowing now that like 22, 23 years old, especially for a male, that a human can grow. But then what starts happening after that age? Anybody know? <laughs> yeah, he starts to shrink. And he starts uh, to de evolve. Whatever the thing is, it, you, you get older, things start to wear out, and all that. A reptile, on the other hand, how many years do they grow? They don't stop. They never stop. From the time they're born to the time they die. How many of you have ever seen a picture of a massive crocodile or something that's been caught? What do they know about that crocodile when they catch it? That it is super old. They can tell that how many years that thing has been alive. So I want you to think about it. When we read the scriptures, it tells us from the Genesis story to the time of Noah, what took place in the environment. I mean, we have literal accounts where it says in the scriptures. Anybody know the oldest man ever recorded in scriptures? Methuselah. Methuselah. Okay. How many years? 969. Yep. That's a long time. Anybody close to that in here? <laughs> so if people could live that long, think about what a crocodile might have looked like back in the time of Noah, back in the time of Methuselah. Think how a crocodile might have grown over a period of almost a thousand years. You know, if you had you, I'll give you this one. I got me a goldfish one time in a carnival. His name ended up becoming Sharky. He was the only one that lived. I never had a goldfish live before. They always died after a couple of weeks. I was good at that. This one survived. 
I got him a 10 gallon tank later on in his life. Do you know why? Because Sharky, our little goldfish, was over a foot long. <laughs> and, a 10, and a 10 gallon tank, all he could do was just turn. That's all he would do in there, just turn. I didn't know what to do. I never had a fish live like that. Think with those crocodiles, those tur turtles, those tor tortoises, these creatures uh, that were living then, how big they would have gotten. Do you think we might find a, a, a skeleton remains of creatures that were so massive that we don't understand it today? Yeah. Here's the thing I want you to understand, and I'm trying to get across to every one of you in this room. When you start from a point of truth, God's word, what he's instructed and given to it, and then you try to figure out those things, it makes so much sense. But what most of the world does is we try to start out here and get to the truth. God revealed himself to us. In the life of his son, Jesus Christ, he showed his attributes, he showed his love, he showed his compassion, he showed his righteousness, and he showed his love and sacrifice. We see the perfect image of God in Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because he was God. I want to read to you again just that last couple of verses, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is God-breathed. Listen to this, my friends. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man, and I will entertain it for you too, you ladies as well, of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I know I have a reputation of being a preacher, and we have a reputation of being a church that is constantly hounding people about reading the Bible. Why? Why is that so important? Yeah. Literally, the description in, in the scripture says it's like eating. Do, is there anybody here in this room I need to remind you to eat? Anybody need a reminder? Hey guys, after you leave church today, you probably should get a little bit of something to eat. I don't need to do that. But I do, as a doctor, need to remind you, read the Bible. Don't be biblically illiterate. When somebody says to you, well, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible? Don't go, yeah, I think so. You know, because most of the time when somebody leads into one of your family, your friends, or somebody you're running to on the street says, doesn't this say somewhere in the Bible? That's almost instantaneously um, a thing, a alarm should go off in your head to go, I uh, know. And I want, before we close out, I want to tell you this as well. If you don't know the answer, one of your family, your friends asks you a question of the Bible, What's one of the best answers that you could give? I don't know. So let me go and look at it, study it, and talk to you tomorrow, a week down the road. Uh, let me see what the scripture says. We are to be people of the Bible, to be people of the truth. When you get out of your car today, I want you to think about it. who's driving the car. And I know real, real quick for me, the other day, and this has been the first time in a long time this has happened. Mandy was driving the car because I had been up for two days with the Bible reading challenge. So I didn't think it was safe for me to drive. But she was driving and I was asleep. I keep waking up every time she broke, would break because I wasn't confident because I wasn't driving. Are you confident in who's driving your bus? If it's not God's word, his truth, his Bible, his word, then you should lack confidence. Experience and feelings and friends and social media and the morning news and all that stuff can't drive your bus. Because if it is, you're in a big problem. This morning, I want to encourage you, in faith, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, to take that step of faith. Not just because of some emotional experience you had here this morning, but because of your wisdom and guidance and truth of what God's Word says. There is no other way to have eternal life, to have a relationship with God, than to surrender your life in a love relationship to Jesus Christ. He tells us to do that by the confessing of our faith, by the baptism of our body, and by our living in a sacrificed life to Him. I want to encourage you to that today. I'm going to pray, and our praise team is going to come up. Would you go ahead and stand as we pray together? 
Father God, you are most high, holy, awesome. Literally, the word awesome means God. You're the one that has created. You're the one that has given. You are the one that has given us the ability to think, to breathe, that we were even here because of you. Lord Jesus, help us to understand that truth and to walk in the relationship that you have provided. We know in and of ourselves that we are sinners, that we are at fault, that we are not righteous, that we have a lost that, and that because of that, we will someday perish. But Lord, we don't want to perish away from you. We need you, Jesus Christ, to make us righteous, to make us holy once again, so that we can spend all eternity with you and eat from the tree of life. Thank you for dying on the cross for us, Jesus. It's in your most holy name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> anything on your heart this morning that you'd like to lay here at the foot of the cross, have any other bitches on each side, you come forward and do that. If there's a phrase you'd like to give Jesus this morning, now's the time to come here. Let's do it.
um, kind of behind the scenes that we sometimes don't even see. Randy preaches, he fixes things, he gets in the attic, he just he does everything that needs to be done around here. And, uh, and Mandy's there right with you too. She's back here today at Sunday school. I teach in Sunday school. So we appreciate you guys. Thank you so very, very much. I want to say thank you to the church family, uh, and especially, you know, mentioning uh, the kids going off to college and stuff. That, uh, um, I've seen lots of preacher families, especially over the years, that have not uh, uh, seen their children head off in paths that are uh, good all the time. And this church family has been a place to nurture and care and provide for our family in such a way that we're seeing that, you know, Aaron is getting ready to head off into the mission fields after he gets married. Uh, Cameron this morning is playing in a Spanish, all Spanish speaking church, uh, leading worship there today. I don't know how well he'll do singing Spanish, but we're working on that. Uh, but you know, uh, God's hand has definitely been on them. You guys have shown them that. And uh, they've learned that truth and are living it now. And uh, I'm just very, very, very grateful for that. And uh, never want to take any for granted. And we do life together. You know, that's what it's all about. And, you know, I, I was even thinking when Mindy, Mindy and Dennis left this morning, they took off to go up to Champagne. Her brother, uh, kidneys are shutting down, and, and they may not have long to live on this earth. And uh, she was just crying, and you know, and uh, I, I'm fine, but as soon as she's crying, then I'm starting to cry too because we're family. You know, we love together, we we cry together, and, and that's the way it works. So I just want to thank you for that. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to do that. That's separate offering today. Oh, yes, I had not set up anything. Okay, so what... Well, uh, well, we well, 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 I'll do the rest of the announcements. If the same people who it did the uh, offering, if you guys would... Uh, we want to take up a special offering today. We have a couple of needs in our church family um, that just the benevolence need is there. Um, Mary Carol, who you all know, uh, comes here, who I have seen come here for no other reason than to bring her offering. I've seen her do that numerous times uh, because of, she holds that so dear to her heart to do that. Um, she works at Kentucky Fried Chicken and a little bit over here at the nursing home. Well, Kentucky Fried Chicken is shut down for two months now while they renovate that. So we want to help her out a little bit. Uh, so go ahead, if you guys would, and, and start taking uh, that offering up, please. Um, and then Melvin and Barb. Um, just, you know, anything we could do there to help out there is needed. Um, as Brandy mentioned last week, uh, Melvin um, uh, has deteriorated his condition, his health. Uh, I know his spiritual health is good, but his physical health is not so good. And we don't know how much longer um, that's going to uh, be around either, unless there's an update. I don't know about that. Yeah, the, uh, the last update we had on uh, Melvin and Barb, uh, Melvin this last week had an appointment in, in a two-week span. <coughs> His PSA had doubled uh, in count. Uh, he's not taking any more chemo. Uh, they are doing some radiation treatments to relieve pain, which I've never really heard of that before, but I guess it's helping. So they will continue with some radiation just for pain relief, but otherwise, the uh, PSA is almost up to a thousand. In yeah. that situation. Yeah. So we appreciate anything you can do there, uh, as well as whatever offering we take today. The church will also uh, put in some for that. Um, out of our general fund just to help with those two benevolence needs. Uh, for our announcements, uh, tonight uh, we have a movie night here watching the movie Breakthrough. I have been told we're probably going to do that inside instead of outside. Uh, I think it is supposed to be a pretty afternoon, but it is just so wet out there I think it might be a little wet and muddy, so I think we're going to do that inside as I've been told. Uh, so if you want to be back there tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, we have some going to have some pizza and sodas and uh, watch that movie. Uh, Wednesday at 9.30, uh, our Bible studies at Farmhouse Bakery, and then we the evening at 6.30 here. Best Beginnings Christmas Party is going to be coming up. There's some information on the dual court out there. Um, Super Kids Rehearsal is going to be starting up. Socks and Sweets donation. We will have the harvest jars here next week. Most of you know the harvest jars. Um, you'll have about a month to fill those up with your pocket change, so you want to get a head start on that this week, but we ask uh, when we have those next week, if you take one per family, you start putting your pocket change in there and we'll collect those all back up about uh, December 8th or so, 
and again, use those as some love gifts and some benevolence uh, help at Christmas time. Uh, so lots of opportunities to help give uh, in Thanksgiving and Christmas season. You have a look out there um, on your uh, on the bulletin board out there, and there's lots of information, shine sign sheets there. Also, uh, Tina has a display set up out here for um, uh, Samaritan's First for that shoebox uh, Christmas time stuff, the uh, shoeboxes, and um, there's a lot of information out there. It's such a great ministry. It goes to, I think I read just, and I didn't read it all, over 100 countries. It takes a lot of logistics to get them all collected up, packaged up, shipped, distributed, and distributed, um, and so it, it's a, it is a big deal. Uh, but there is information out there about it. Tina, are you going to be by the table for a little bit there? Just, just to let people know about that? Okay, great. So um, I think all the resources are there, maybe even the shoe boxes. I'm not sure uh, if those are there too that you, you would need to do that. Um, also, I know of at least one birthday this week. Beth Davis has a birthday this week. Shirley has a birthday. She had a birthday. On the 17th. Yep. Any others besides Beth and Shirley? Happy birthday. Praise Lord and honor. Thank you for this time of meeting here for study, for uh, the ability to love you with our mind, heart, soul, and strength. Help us to do that well and to continue to spread the gospel as we leave out from here. It's in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Somebody in the church says, always give God your best and I'll give you the rest.